See, God is a God of patterns. He's a God of science. There's a pattern to the things he does. He doesn't do things one-off because he's prophetic. What he does in the Old Testament is pointing to something he will do in the New Testament. And so there are certain patterns that will be littered around what he does in the Old Testament so that when he begins to do it in the New, you can now say, oh, this is that. This is that. There are parallels in the Bible that will give you insight into what God is fulfilling. Are you there? Okay. So, verse number one, it says, For the law, having a shadow of things to come, the first thing about the law is that it is prophetic. Second thing you need to know is that it is not the very image of the things. And the sacrifices that were offered therein could not make such that came unto it perfect. Moses knew the things that God will accept. He knew the things that God will be satisfied about. And if we want to study priesthood, there's no way we can escape studying the life and the ministry of Moses. Do you still remember um, the Passover? The Passover in Egypt? Do you still remember it? See, so remember what was about to happen? It was the angel of death that was about to visit Egypt. It was already concluded. God had given the decree, and the angel of death was mobilized. And then Moses now, because he has a relationship with God, went to consult God, and God gave him a word of wisdom. The word of wisdom that God gave Moses could not stop the decree that had gone forth about the angel of death visiting Egypt. But the word of wisdom that God gave to Moses was able to confuse the angel. He said, take the blood of a ram, put it on your doorpost, put it on the lintel of your house. And the children of Israel did it. When the angel of death came to Israel, he said, ah, somebody help me kill the firstborn here. So he passed over. So when you hear Passover, don't think that they were preferred just because they were Israelites. They were preferred, they were, the angel that was sent to carry out their assignment was confused because Moses operated a wisdom that came from a superior realm. So in the eyes of that angel, the sons of Goshen, the firstborn of Goshen were already sacrificed. That's why he passed over to finish the assignment. He said, somebody help me. Oh. The person has helped me to do this assignment. He said, that's where priesthood comes in. Oh my, you are not here. You are not here. You, you heard what uh, Sister Queen, where is Queen? Do you know people have been asking me questions? That, okay, if, if some, a wizard can raise the dead, hey, then what are we doing? I said, calm down. So, so I went on research. When you were sleeping, <laughs> when you were sleeping yesterday, I was researching. Now, do you realize, so Queen will need to come and confirm this. The only people that your grandfather could raise from the dead were people that witchcraft killed. There is a difference between witchcraft death and normal death. Normal death comes by a decree from God, from the sovereign. Witchcraft death is like, like an arm robber praying on something that is not his own. It's not in the archives, it's not in the records that this person should depart at this time. They use witchcraft to edge the person out. It was not as if an arm robber came to break his skull. It was witchcraft they used to edge him out. And when they edge people out like that, they are, they are prison houses that they can be kept for a time. Their spirit, I mean. It is from those prison houses that the man had wisdom in the priesthood of darkness as to how to set that captive free. So it was not actual resurrection. It's just restoration of what was stolen. Your people called me and said, hey, so wizards can... I uh, say, calm down, calm down, it's okay. But do you, see, do you see how much control that wizard had because of the knowledge of priesthood? I finish teaching, then you see people outside. Ah, oh, Some will say, we came from... You know what? It's the knowledge of priesthood that is lacking. That's why the people of God look helpless because they lack spiritual knowledge. There is no way we can master this thing without looking 
at the ministry of Moses. Exactly. Now, see what Samuel did. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your heart, and put away the strange gods and asteroids from among you, and prepare your heart unto the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. Then the children of Israel did put away Balim and Ashtaroth and served the Lord only. Verse 5, And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mishpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together in Mishpah, and drew water, and poured it out before the Lord. That is like a libation. And fasted on that day, and said, we have sinned against the Lord, and Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together in Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said unto Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord God for us, that he will save us out of the hands of the Philistines. And Samuel took a suckling lamb. Where did he get that knowledge? Hmm. You know what? You might lack soldiers in your army. You might lack, you might lack economists in your cabinet. Are you there? Don't lack a priest that knows the way of priesthood. These guys were, 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 in, were in national repentance and the Philistines felt they were vulnerable because they were by the altar of prayer. They said, let's kill them before they recover. <laughs> when the wind of what they had in mind got to Samuel, he took the, the, the child, the child of a lamb. <laughs> Jesus Christ. How did he know that that was what was required? and offered it for a burnt offering, holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel, but the Lord turned that from heaven. That means that offering moved the hand of God. <laughs> we, we are going to study the Bible. You see, hey, there were battles in scripture that they were not fought with sword and shield. Your certificate can give you access to the place, but to survive the place, you will need something else. So what I'm saying is that uh, Moses helped us with all the details of how to appease God. The idea of the book of Leviticus was that God is a holy God and man is a sinful man. What, how can a holy God deal with sinful man? His nature of holiness will make him judge sinful man, so there is no possibility of sinful man, sinful man doing business with the holy God. Hence the need for priesthood. Moses was able to gain insight into all the kinds of sacrifices that are needed to appease God so that humankind can have dealings with a holy God. So by the time we go into the book of Leviticus, which I would like you to go in your personal time, because I've already gone there, so let me tell you what is there. The first thing you'll find in the book of Leviticus are the three, five, sorry, five offerings that God has approved. So Moses was able to journey into the heart of God and he was able to distill five types of offerings that can appease God, that can satisfy God. Is that clear? And the objective of these offerings is to bring us to a point where we can have a relationship with God. Because God knows that if we can relate with him, then there is nothing that is around our human existence that is omnipotence 
that is 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 grace and wisdom will not swallow up the thing is create a way let us relate with god and if that's what you want you will need to offer elaborate sacrifices because of the kind of being that god he is he is a holy god so for the bible says that he had made him to be seen for us who knew no sin jesus knew no sin but God in judgment put him in the place of sin. And that was uh, the principle of substitution that was at work. So he knew no sin that he might be made, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Uh, I, I would like you to see the beauty of substitution. The beauty of substitution. God made him that knew no sin to become sin so that you and I will become the righteousness of God in him. So if you have received Jesus into your life, the sacrifice of the sin offering has been offered in your stead. The application of that sacrifice has worked his goodwill in your life such that your new status in the new covenant is that you are the righteousness of God in him. That was only possible because God made him that knew no sin. He made him sin so that you can become what? The righteousness of God in him. I hope you know this righteousness is not a function of our works. This righteousness is a function of Christ. Christ has become our righteousness. Christ is the one that paid the price in order for us to have the stature of righteousness. And what it means to be righteous is the kind of thing that a, a judge declares in court after a case has come to the head and he's, he, he, all right, so he, he hits it and he says, this man, Faye B has been discharged and acquitted she has been declared righteous now after that declaration that the judge gave even if she is the culprit it is no longer so in the eyes of the law how the law sees is according to what was declared and the law has said that she is declared righteous your status of righteousness within the context of the new testament and the new covenant is not a function of what you did it's a function of what jesus did it's not one of the things you did in order to qualify for is one of the things that was given to you as a gift. So the Bible says, how much more they that have received the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. The reason why it's called the gift of righteousness is because you do not do anything to earn it. It is Christ that has become your righteousness and showed me his will. It was this Bible. So I studied it. I studied it back and front. I saw it for many years, many years. If you know, it was from my pool of study I stood up to come and teach you today. If you know how many books I've consulted, how many references I've read, I've journeyed into the thoughts of many theologians on the subject of priesthood. Even though the teaching anointing is good. You, you think what I'm doing is natural. No, what I dispense, you will get it through study. <laughs> if I want to preach a good sermon, I need four days. Four days of research. Four days of research. Three days of research and one day to speak in tongues. After I finish the research, then I now speak in tongues. Then the thing will now become flesh. I have served God in this way. And I've seen how God will bring a humble dispenser of truth from the backside of the wilderness in Makodi and take him to stand among the nations. Greatness is in service. So a man that is consecrated unto God, it will be easy for him to know the mind of God. And a man that is consecrated unto God, it will be easy for him to walk the walk of holiness. That will become what will be most natural to him. In order for you to commit sin, to be a work of the flesh, it means hard labor 
because you need to violate your conscience, violate the promptings of the Holy Ghost, violate the cry of the Holy Ghost. You need to put in a lot of effort in order for you to live, to walk in sin, to produce unrighteousness. Because it will be a consecrated man finds it easy to walk the walk of holiness. Because he's first of all constituted with the nature of righteousness and that nature of righteousness will compel him 